Good morning. Um, my name is Thomas, and today um, I would like to share uh, some of my knowledge about cross-compilation tool chains. I'm kind of surprised by the number of folks in the in the audience for for such a topic, but well, that's interesting. So I work at Frolectrons, um, um, acting as the CTO of, of this um, consulting company. I mainly work on the kernel uh, daytime and on build root nighttime. Um, so build root is an embedded Linux build system, and part of the knowledge for this talk comes from this experience working on this on this tool. And I happen to live in, in uh, uh, southwest of France, in the uh, uh, sunny uh, city of Toulouse. And on the, the, the right hand side of the, the slide here, you can see a drawing from a, a very nice artist who uh, draws sketches from um, speakers and, and audience members at the Canal Recipes Conference, which takes place every year in September in Paris, and it took place uh, two weeks ago. I think it's a nice conference, so if you've never had the chance to attend, I recommend attending it. They are very, very good speakers. So kind of the shameless plug for, for this uh, nice conference. Um, but um, to give you a chance to leave the room, um, in case you're not really interested, I wanted to just make sure that we're on the same page on what this talk is going to be about. I'm not a toolchain developer. I'm, I work on a build system with many other people, so I do have some amount of knowledge about compilation, cross-compilation issues, but I'm definitely not a GCC or Benadryls or C library developer, by all means. Um, it's really some, some experience gained by building simple toolchains for um, an embedded Linux build system. So this talk is really an uh, introduction type of talk and not in-depth type of talk. So if you already have some knowledge about tool chains, feel free to just leave the room right now. I won't be um, surprised by that. So we're, we're going to focus on, on simple GCC-based tool chain. We're not going to cover LLVM. We're not going to cover advanced use cases like uh, link time optimization, graphite optimizations, other things like that. We're really going to stay in kind of the really basic cases. Um, I see nobody left. So hopefully um, all of you are going to be interested by what I follow in, in my talk. So what is a cross-compilation tool chain? That's obviously the first question to ask. So it's a set of tools that allows you to build source into binary code for a target platform that's different from the one you're currently running on, on the one that's on which the, the build process is operating. Uh, most of the, the time people think of it as different CPU architecture, but it can also be different operating system, different C library, um, different ABI, and things like that. So for example, if you're on x86, uh, Linux x86, and you want to build an x86 binary for Windows, you're doing cross-compilation, even though it's the same CPU architecture. Um, if you are on, let's say, building on ARM, so your machine is an ARM platform, uh, that's using a given ABI, and when you want to target a different ABI, it's also cross-compilation. Um, in, in this build process, uh, three machines are involved. Um, the build machine, which is where the build takes place, the host machine, which is where the execution takes place, and the target machine for which the programs might be generating code. So in most Linux distributions, you have a pre-built native toolchain, which is the one you use to uh, build application that you run on the same machine. And um, this toolchain has been built with build equal host equal target. For example, you have an x86 machine. It has been built on x86. It runs on x86 and provides and generates binaries that runs on x86. That's a native toolchain case. The cross-compilation case is where build is the same as host, but different from the targets. So for example, you are um, building a toolchain on x86, running it on x86, but it produces binaries for a different CPU architecture or different operating system or different ABI. So the target is different. Those three machines, they directly correspond to the uh, three arguments of all um, autoconf configure scripts that have the same name, build, host, and target. Um, so by default, when you run a configure script, it automatically guesses that you want to do native build. So when you do cross compilation, you need to override these uh, to specify what you want to do exactly. Um, so the autoconf specifies a concept of what they call system definitions that uh, are represented by tuples. So a system definition describes a system. It defines its CPU architecture, its C library, its operating system, its vendor, its ABI, and sometimes a bunch of other information. It takes different forms. The full form is the one that you can see on the slide. It's Arch, Vendor, OS, and then some combination of information about the C library and the ABI. There are shorter forms that, for example, avoid the vendor part. So the different components that you have are relatively easy. 
So the Arch is the definition of the CPU architecture. It can be R, MIPS, x86, and a bunch of others. The vendor is mostly a freeform string. Um, it's uh, just a string that identifies the, the, the company or the entity that uh, produced the toolchain. Uh, there are just a few corner cases where it actually means something, but for most situations, it, it's just a freeform string. Um, the OS is the operating system you're targeting. Um, so for the case of this talk, we're only going to consider the cases non and Linux, and I'm going to explain in a few slides what, what they mean. Uh, but there are, of course, other possible operating systems. And then libc ABI, as the name suggests, gives details on which C library you're using and uh, which ABI you're using. And we're also going to talk about C libraries and ABIs in the, in the rest of that talk. So here are some examples. ARM foo non eABI is um, a, a toolchain tuple that uh, indicates that it's a bare metal toolchain. So the non part says it's a bare metal toolchain that targets the ARM architecture uh, coming from a given vendor and using the ABI eABI. ARM unknown Linux GNU ABI HF. It's a Linux toolchain, as the OS part of the tuple suggests. Uh, it comes from some unknown vendor, targets the ARM architecture, uses the glibc C library, and the eABI HF ABI. So all those information are encoded in the tuple. And it goes on and on, like uh, with the ARM, uh, Big Indian, Linux targeting, uselibc using um, eABI um, uh, tuple, which is the third one here, or another one for the MIPS architecture that you see uh, on the slide. So the main two values of operating system we're interested in in, in this talk are uh, known and Linux. And you saw some example of these in, in the previous slides. So none is used for bare metal tool chains. So they are used for development without an operating system. <coughs> so directly on the metal, as, as the name uh, suggests. Um, the C library in use in such cases is generally newlib. So it provides C library services that do not require an operating system, like streak manipulation and uh, compare and other basic services that do not require an operating system beyond it. And then optionally, in newlib, you can enable a number of basic uh, kind of system calls by uh, implementing hardware-specific operations or connecting that to your uh, small real-time operating system if you have, if you have one. Um, but it's, it's mainly meant for um, uh, development without any operating system. So you can use such tool chains to, in, the, in the Linux context to build your bootloader, to build your Linux kernel, but you cannot use that to build uh, user space Linux code. The second type of tool chain are Linux tool chains. So they are used to um, develop um, Linux user space applications and shared libraries. So their main difference with uh, bare metal um, tool chains is that they contain a full feature C library that integrates with an operating system, in that case, a Linux kernel. Um, there are different C libraries that are available, and we're going to talk more about that in the, in the next slides as well. In, in that case, the C library supports Linux system calls. So when you're um, uh, creating a network socket, when you're opening a file, or anything like that, the C library talks to the, the, the kernel to um, get access to this service, as opposed to bare metal, where no such services are, are available. So such tool chains can be used to build um, Linux user space code. But they can also be used because they are kind of a, more or less of a superset of bare metal tool chains. They can also be used to build your bootloader or your kernel. So if you're already building um, your, your kernel or your uh, bootloader, you may be using a Linux capable tool chain. Even though the C library is not being used, it, it just works fine. So what do we have in a cross compilation tool chain? We essentially have four main components. So it's not that complicated in the end. If you kind of dive a little bit in, in, into it, it's, it's not that, that bad. So we have four main components, the binutils, GCC, the Linux kernel headers, and the C libraries. And that's pretty much all what we need to build uh, a tool chain from, from scratch. So a few dependencies are needed to build GCC. I'm going to cover that as well. But they are kind of pretty easy to, to build and to use uh, libraries. Uh, so let's cover those components one by one. The binutils, provided by the group project, and they define it as a collection of binary tools. You have two main tools. Yes, which is the assembler. It turns uh, assembly code uh, written in text format into binary code. And you have the linker, LD, which takes a bunch of object files and combines them into another object file or a shared library or an executable. So that those are obviously the two most important tools from, from, from the binutils. And the, it also provides a number of other like debugging analysis or other kind of tools um, to analyze binaries. So if you have Never use like ReDLF, Objdump, stuff like that. It's very, very useful uh, tools for stripping binaries and so on and so forth. But those are not that um, important for the, the compilation process by itself. LD and AS are by far the most important ones. 
Um, the bin details, it needs to be configured um, for each CPU architecture. So if you have a native um, x86 bin tils on your, on your system, which you probably have as part of your Linux <coughs> distro, it cannot by itself build um, or manipulate ARM binaries. So it can be configured um, to, you can configure bin tils to support multiple CPU architectures, um, but by default it's generally built with just um, targeting one CPU architecture. Um, so that's why it's not as simple as using your native bin utils and passing some arguments to say, hey, build some ARM stuff or build some PowerPC stuff. You generally need to build a separate uh, bin utils. Building bin utils is pretty easy. It's just uh, auto tools based, so it is configure script, you run it. The only thing you need to say is what you're targeting. So here we find again the build host target um, uh, well, parameters. I've left out build and host because it just let um, autoconf guess what my build machine is and my host machine is because I want to build on my laptop and run on my laptop. It's the only thing I want to override is for which architecture I'm going to um, be generating uh, binaries. And in that case, I'm going to generate for ARM, Linux, uh, GNU, ABI, HF system. Another thing that you need to pass is the sysroot. It's a directory that contains stuff. For now, I leave it to that because I'm going to talk more about the sysroot a little bit later. The next component is obviously GCC. It's by far the, the one that is kind of your entry point into, into the tool chain and not the one you um, manipulate directly. So it's the GNU compiler collection project from, from GNU. Um, it has front ends for many uh, source languages, C, C++, Ada, Fortran, and others. I just read that they I think got rid of the Java support in, in, uh, in recent times. Um, it has backends for many CPU architectures, so it essentially converts um, the, sor the source front ends, they convert the source code into an intermediate representation. It applies a huge number of optimization passes on these intermediate representations. And then the backends, they take this intermediate representation and convert it into um, assembly code for a sp specific CPU architecture. So it does not generate by itself binary code, it only take, uh, generates text assembly code, and uh, AS needs to do the rest of the, of the work. It provides uh, different things. It provides compilers themselves, so CC1 for C, CC1 plus for C++, and it has others for if you support other languages. But those are not the ones you uh, normally use directly. Because GCC is, in fact, uh, the second item in the list here, in fact provides what they call compiler drivers, so kind of a wrapper program that will orchestrate the different steps of the build. So when you run GCC or when you run G++, Behind the doors, what it's doing is that it's calling the actual compiler itself, so CC1 or CC1 plus. It will be calling the assembler, it will be calling the linker for you, and doing all the work for you. So G GCC and G++ are not the compilers themselves, they just drive the compilation process. And then you should, of course, always use them. Another thing that GCC provides, and that uh, some people are not necessarily aware of, is that it provides um, runtime libraries as well. So it is the compiler itself, but it also provides a bunch of libraries that you need on your target to be able to run those programs. And there are different parts of the um, GCC runtime, uh, libgcc itself, uh, libstd++, which is the standard C++ library, and other runtime for other languages. So like Fortran has its own runtime, and other languages may have their own runtime as well. And the last thing that uh, GCC provides is the, um, the set of headers for the standard C++ library. So GCC is providing not only the compiler, but also runtime uh, libraries for uh, various languages. Building GCC is a bit more involved than building binutils. It's not like a single configure line and then off you go. Uh, there's a two-step process that we're going to cover a little bit later to, to build GCC in a cross-compilation situation. The next... Um, component in any cross compilation tool chain um, are the kernel headers. So the, what we want ultimately to build is a C library, but our C library wants to communicate with our Linux kernel. And in order to communicate with our Linux kernel, needs to know the system call numbers, the various data structures, various uh, definitions, and things like that, that actually come from the kernel. And uh, in a, instead of duplicating this information in the C library, they are kind of shared and extracted from, from the kernel. So in the kernel uh, source code, there are, there's a split in, um, in the headers between user space visible headers and internal kernel headers. And this split has been done like a few years ago, I think. It used to be kind of a mess, um, and nowadays it's, it's much better organized in, in the kernel sources. So there are uh, UAPI um, directories in include uh, Linux and other places in, in the kernel, where UAPI stands for user space API. So those are the headers that are visible to user space. 
and um, other canine leaders are not exposed to user space. There is a special uh, target in the, in the kernel build system called headers install that will take all those UAPI headers from uh, that, the generic ones plus the one for your specific architectures and a bunch of, bunch of other things. And that will be uh, messaging them a little bit. There are a few things that need to be, to be adjusted in them and then install them into a location. So it's just installing a bunch of header files that describe the kernel system calls, kernel data structures, a number of definitions, and so on. Um, as of Linux 4.8, it installed uh, about 700 header files, so it's quite, quite a bunch of header files uh, installed here. One, one question that comes up pretty often when um, people are, are building or using uh, existing tool chains is, uh, I'm running a given kernel version on my system, like let's say Linux uh, 4.7, and I have a tool chain that uses um, kernel headers that was built, I don't know, two years ago. It's using kernel headers 3.10. Is that the problem? Or the opposite is I have a system that's, I don't know, running 3.10 and I have a very modern tool chain that's using kernel headers 4.4. Is that a problem? So the kernel to user space um, ABI is backward compatible. So the kernel developers are normally never uh, removing system calls or changing the semantics of existing system calls. They are only extending this API with uh, potentially more flags, more system calls, uh, more features, but they are not changing what already exists. So uh, the consequence of that is as long as the, the headers um, that have, be, have been used to produce your cross compilation tool chain are at least as old as the kernel you're actually running in the target, you're fine. If you're using a tool chain that has headers that are more recent than the kernel you actually run, then your C library will think that your kernel will support system call A, B, or C that is very new, but your kernel will not actually provide them. And that will not work. So when you're choosing a tool chain or building your tool chain, just need to make sure that you have headers that are at least as old as the kernel that you intend to run on your system. You don't need to have the exact same version. So back to the, the example I had, if you run 4.7, and that's the kernel you actually build and run on your target, but the, your toolchain has been built with kernel header 3.10, that's just fine. It will work fine, all right? So you don't need to have an exact match there. Um, if you want to know the, 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 the version of the kernel headers that are in use in your toolchain, uh, Linux kernel has a file called linux slash version.h and it contains this Linux version code definition that is a bit cryptic to, um, uh, to read, but it actually contains the, the three, um, three digits of the, the kernel version, like in that case it's 3.13.0, uh, so it's pretty cryptic to get from, from 19936, but you get the, the, the magic um, uh, formula just, uh, just below, so it's not that a big deal to infer that. The next uh, component is the C library. So it provides the implementation of uh, well, the POSIX standard and, and very often a number of extensions the, um, that are uh, either Linux specific or sometimes even C library specific. <coughs> they are, um, for the ones that we really care about, are uh, based on Linux system calls. And there are several implementations available. Uh, Glibc, uh, uslibcng, muscle, uh, bionic, which is used for Android systems and a few other more special purpose. So I already covered Newlib, which is uh, or mainly bare metal. So this one is kind of an exception. It's not based on Linux system calls. And uh, that libc or klibc that are really like tiny, very, very tiny C library that cannot be, really be used to build, um, I would say, full featured user space uh, applications, but more for uh, very minimal uh, Linux systems. So I'm mainly going to cover uh, glibc, uslibc, and muscle as the, the, the three main, most important C libraries that can be used to build uh, um, full featured Linux user space. Um, so before we get into the details about those do three uh, C libraries, what, what they provide, um, they provide uh, each of them provide a dynamic linker. So the dynamic linker is the program that actually gets triggered when you run a dynamically linked application. It's not actually your application that starts up first. First, it's the dynamic linker, which is responsible for uh, mapping in memory the shared libraries that your uh, application is using. Of course, that's only for dynamically linked application. If you have a statically linked application, no dynamic linker is involved. That's provided by the C library. Uh, it's the C library, of course, provides well, the C library itself, libc.so, and sometimes a bunch of companion libraries, libm, librt, um, libpthread, and so on, providing other parts of the, the POSIX um, uh, standard functions. And obviously, it provides the standard C library headers, uh, stdio.h and uh, string.h, stdlib.h, and so on and so forth. Probably well aware of the, the POSIX interface. So the three C libraries that are, um, 
I would say, widely used today in, on, on, on Linux systems uh, are first the, the glibc. That's the de facto standard. Uh, every Linux uh, desktop or server machine is, is using glibc, provided by the GNU project, started in, say, in, in, in the 80s. That's the full featured C library, uh, supports many architectures, many operating systems. Uh, for uh, the folks doing embedded, um, uh, glibc has no support for no MME architecture. So if you're doing ARM, Cortex-M, or if you're doing, I would say, Blackfin, or Microblaze, no MMU, or those kind of uh, no MMU architectures, the GLIPC is just not a possible choice. There is no official support for static linking. It kind of works in some specific situations, but the GLIPC developers explicitly say that it's not supported. So dynamic linking is kind of the, the only supported way. It does provide ABI backward compatibility. So what this means is that if you build and link, a pro of course, dynamic, dynamically, a program against glibc, you can, uh, a year from now, upgrade glibc to a newer version of glibc without relinking your application. It will continue to work. So that's kind of helpful, obviously, for um, uh, binary distributions, because they can upgrade the C library without necessarily rebuilding the entire world that sits on top of it. There's almost no configurability. So it's just you build C lib this glibc, you have all of it or none of it. Um, and it used to be too big for embedded, so that's why some of the alternatives that we're going to talk about exist. Uh, but whether it's still the case really depends on your situation. Even ARM systems have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and have more flash, more RAM, and so on. So what used to be uh, relevant alternatives uh, 10 years ago may not necessarily be very useful anymore. So lots of people are using glibc and embedded systems. That per that's perfectly fine. It's licensed under LGPL v2.1 or later, which is kind of an important criteria. There are other uh, licensing options for other C libraries. The other one um, that is also um, usually quite well known is uh, Uselipsy, or it's now uh, called Uselipsy NG. It's been started in the year 2000, and the goal was to uh, provide a smaller C library. At the time, embedded systems had like 8 megs of flash, 16 megs of flash, so the size really matter. And as I said, nowadays many embedded systems have much, uh, much higher uh, capacity, so that's not necessarily as useful as it used to be. But we still, people still work on, on, on systems uh, that have such low amount of flash, and that, in that case, Uselipsy or some other possibilities are, are still interesting to have. It provides a high-level, um, high-level way of configuring the, the C library. So compared to Uselipsy, that's just all or nothing. In Uselipsy, you can select what features you want. You want network support, you want IPv6 support, you want thread support, you want locally support, and so on and so forth. So you can fine tune the C library to whatever you need. Um, it supports many architectures, including some not necessarily supported in Uselipsy. Doing a Uselipsy port is um, often easier than doing a Uselipsy port. So some of the people doing new CPU architectures, they very often start by a Uselipsy port, uh, as that yeah, that's e an easier target. Compared to glibc, however, it only targets Linux as an operating system. So it's kind of a, a narrow focus. They don't provide any ABI backward compatibility. So if you upgrade uselibc to a newer version, you may need to rebuild all the libraries and applications that rely on it, which for most embedded systems can be fine, but necessarily for binary distributions. It supports a number of no MMU architectures. Um, ARM, no MMU, Blackfin, and others that I already mentioned. So that's one feature that glibc does not have at all. Uh, some people think that it's related to Yusel Linux in some way because of the name, but it's not anymore related to Yusel Linux, and Yusel Linux itself doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, so Yusel Lipsy is just yet another C library that you can use on top of the Linux kernel. It's not like GLIPC is for Linux and Yusel Lipsy is for Yusel Linux. That's completely wrong. Um, Yusel Lipsy is used on top of the regular Linux kernel on ARM x86 MIP system with MMU support, so it's completely unrelated. So. Don't be confused by the, 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 the similar naming. There is explicit support for static linking. It's one of the, one of the original goal of um, Uselipsis to support static linking and, and produce uh, relatively small binaries even when doing static linking. So the original Uselipsis project is kind of dead. There has been no release since May 2012. And, but um, since, I would say, last year or a year and a half or something like that, I don't know if Valdemar is in the room. Um, is Valdemar in the room? Not in the room. But he's here at the conference. So Valdemar Broadcorp, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, took over the project and forked it under Uselipsy NG. And since then, he has been doing, I think, 18 or 19 releases over a year or a year and a half. So the project is active again. Um, 
I think he has merged uh, new, archi new CPU architectures, uh, dropped some old that were obsolete and not working, so the project is now kicking again. And it, that, that's very nice because it used to be uh, um, really a pain to, to work with a, a, dead, a dead upstream project. Nowadays it's really uh, working again. Um, it's licensed LGPL v2.1, um, pretty much like JLPC, um, uh, except it doesn't have the or later uh, statement. The last one um, uh, that is um, interesting is, is Muscle. So it started much more recently, only 2011. Uh, and one key difference is that it's MIT licensed. So some people are, are getting interested in, in, in the project just because of its licensing. It is under very active development. The mailing list is, is very, very busy. There is support for a, a fairly large range of CPU architectures already. And more is being added um, release after release. They recently added no MMU support for uh, Super H2, uh, specifically for the G-Core uh, open source processor. There was a talk at last ELC in, in the US about this, this processor, so you want to check out the, the videos. Uh, it was an interesting one. Uh, there's no configurability, uh, but it's still small, even currently smaller than, uh, than Uselipsy. And especially for statically linked scenarios, it's, it's uh, pretty, pretty good. Uh, they they um, try to conform to standards in a very, very strict way, uh, sometimes even stricter than, than GLPC and UCLPC, which can cause a few build issues with, with user space libraries and applications that you, that you may have. And they have a very, very nice page comparing the, the, the three C libraries in much more details than I can do in, in, in such a talk. So there is this very nice table with list of features and whether GLPC supports it, UCLPC supports it, Muscle supports it. So it's a very good way of uh, kind of comparing the, the different options here. Uh, in terms of size, I did a, a, a quick um, tool chain build with, with build root uh, using um, GLPC, UCLPC, and Muscle. So I was targeting an ARM um, Therm2 uh, architecture, and I tested um, so those three uh, C libraries. So you can see that um, the C library itself and all its companion libraries and the dynamic linker in the case of GLIPC weights about 1.7 megs, and GLIPC and Muscle are more around uh, alpha meg for the, 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 full, the full thing. So when uh, I say Muscle as uh, not available, not available, it's not uh, exactly not available, it's not applicable. Muscle has a principle that everything is inside libc.so. Even the dynamic linker is libc.so itself, so there's just a single file that you need to install and it contains all the, the, all the functions, so it's not that like thread is not available. It's not at all, it's directly in libc.so itself. Um, UCLibc uh, migrated to this model as well in the latest release 1.0.18, which wasn't used at the time I did the, the measurement. Uh, so those are based on 1.0.17, which is just a release before that. But UCLIPC is moving to the same, the same model. And just to give a rough idea. So if you have like um, 256 megabytes of flash, of course, size, the size doesn't matter at all. And you could just as well use GLIPC, that's fine. If you have 16 megs of flash, uh, a meg, uh, meg point two of saving starts to be a little bit interesting. Um, back to um, other components of the tool chain that you need. Uh, there are a number of mathematic libraries that are needed to build uh, GCC. Uh, it's pretty arcane and, and weird stuff, but it's anyway needed for to build uh, GCC. So you need to three libraries, MPFR, GMP, and MPC. So GMP is just a dependency of MP, MPFR. MPFR and MPC are used um, by GCC to make uh, calculations on floating point numbers and uh, complex numbers at build time. So if your program or library is having as a number of constants, uh, floating point constants or complex constants um, with uh, mathematic operations, GCC is evaluating them at build time. And to do that, it needs uh, arbitrary precision uh, libraries to help doing those calculations. So that's the, um, as I per my understanding, the only reason why they are used. So it's kind of a very specific um, usage of um, those libraries, but they are nonetheless uh, uh, absolutely needed to build, uh, to build GCC. So they are needed on the host machine. They are only needed to run GCC itself. So you need to have them on your host machine, but they are definitely not needed on, on the target. So the overall build process uh, to build the toolchain is not that complicated. A lot of people think it's, it's um, like something completely crazy. It's not that crazy. You just need to build binitils. So it's just a one configure, make, make, install um, kind of thing with not that many arguments to the configure script. Then you need to build dependencies of GCC, MPFR, GMP, and MPC. 
Um, and uh, those are just built for the host, so it's native builds, configure script, uh, configure make, make install for each of them, pretty easy. Then you install the kernel headers, and you've seen um, previously it's just uh, one single comment to say, hey, uh, please install the kernel headers for this architecture, and that's, that's, that's all you need to do. That's also pretty easy. And then you can um, start the, the, the biggest part of the, the toolchain build. You need to build a first stage GCC. And this first stage GCC, we build a GCC that has no um, C library support, that um, has uh, only support for static linking, and is, uh, has only support for the C language, and it's kind of a limited uh, GCC that we put kind of on the side. And we use this first stage GCC to build the C library. Obviously, the C library needs to be built for the target, so we need to have a cross compiler to build it. So we use this first stage GCC. And once we have the C library produced, its dynamic linker and everything else, then we can build the final GCC, which needs the C library to already be built. Because obviously, GCC is going to generate uh, binaries. Those binaries encode uh, the path to the dynamic linker. They, it encodes um, uh, the shared library names for the C library, for the pthread libraries, and so on and so forth. So it really needs to know which C library is being used. So the C library, unlike all other libraries that you might build later on for crypto or network or graphics or whatever, is really an integral part of the toolchain. It's not something that's separate from the toolchain. So if you want to change the C library, you need to recreate a new toolchain. Um, from these steps, um, the first three, um, it's, these steps look kind of sequential, but there's no uh, interdependency between the first three steps. You can build binutils, uh, MPFR, GMP, MPC, install the canine headers in whichever order you want. Uh, you can even do that in parallel if you want. Uh, there is just that uh, binutils, the GCC dependencies are, are needed to start building GCC, the first stage GCC, and the canine headers are on, only needed at the time you start building the C library. It's just to kind of make it clear uh, what the dependencies are. And maybe this, I don't know if it's really readable, uh, makes it a little bit even clearer. So that's the um, dependency chain of the packages in build root that produce a cross compilation tool chain based on uh, glibc. Um, so it's a dependency chain, so the uh, build order is uh, the reverse of the one you can see here. So the build actually starts from there and goes up in this direction. So to build uh, OS GCC initial, we need OS binutils, we need OS MPC, and, and so on and so forth. To build glibc, we need OS GCC initial and the kernel headers. And to build OS GCC final, we need glibc to be built. But that's pretty much all what you need to build uh, a pretty uh, simple and working toolchain. And with that, um, we build a large uh, embedded Linux system. You can build a Qt, x.org, whatever, big, big user space uh, programs. And there's nothing else uh, than those uh, four main components. So if we dive a little bit more, and I'm not sure how far I am in the, in the talk. Oh, time is flying. Um, another interesting part to discuss when talking about toolchain is the concept of sysroot. So remember when I mentioned the build process for binutils, there was, there was this dash dash with sysroot uh, configure argument. So what is this sysroot thing? And this sysroot is um, the logical root directory for headers and libraries. That's kind of the official definition from, um, I think, the GCC documentation or whatever, or maybe binutils. So this is where GCC automatically looks for headers. So when you're doing sharp include stdio.h, where is GCC looking into? In what we call the sysroot. And this is where LD looks for libraries. So when you do dash uh, um, small l, um, I don't know, foo, uh, LD is going to look for libfoo in the sysroot. Um, so that's where we want to put all the headers and, and libraries that are going to be used by your compiler. Um, both GCC and binutils, when you create a sysroot aware um, toolchain, are built with dash dash sysroot equal some location, which obviously is, is the same for the, for the two. And what we do is that we install the kernel headers, the C library, and its headers all in the sysroot, so that your uh, compiler automatically finds them at the right location. This sysroot is an absolute pass on your build machine. So the question is, what happens if you move your toolchain around, like you move it into to a separate machine or a, in different location in your system? Well, GCC is an LD or a kind of smart enough that if the sysroot is a subdirectory of the prefix, then it will automatically be capable of recalculating the relative location of the, the, the toolchain and its, and its sysroot and be capable of finding the headers and libraries even if the toolchain was moved around. However, if the prefix and the sysroot are completely separate in different places, it won't be able to find them again. Right? So most of the people who build toolchains that 
need to be relocatable that you can move around in your system or install in other machines in other locations, uh, have this sysroot as a subdirectory of the prefix. You can override it at runtime using um, the uh, dash dash sysroot GCC options. Um, so for example, in buildroot we leverage it because we create an our own sysroot where we install all the libraries that you build for your embedded Linux system. So we override the, the sysroot that's used at um, using this runtime option. And you can at any time uh, print the current sysroot using the dash print dash sysroot uh, GCC option. Um, most tool chains have just one sysroot, so they have one copy of the C library, one copy of the kernel headers, one copy of the C library headers, um, and that's just fine. But um, those libraries, um, so the, the runtime libraries for GCC and the C library, they are built for the target, right? So those are, are meant to be installed on your targets. They are contain ARM code or MIPS code or PowerPC code or whatever CPU architecture you're targeting. So at the time you build your tool chain, you are deciding um, what optimization level and what exact CPU architecture variant you're targeting. Are you targeting ARMv6, ARMv7, ARMv5, with floating point, without floating point, with this ABI or that ABI? You're de deciding that at the time you build a tool chain because the tool chain is not just the cross compiler, but it's also a set of runtime libraries that are built for your target. Uh, so if you have a tool chain that is like <coughs> contains, I don't know, an ARMv7, um, build C library and your target is ARMv5, no luck. You will put the C library on your uh, target and it's not going to work. Um, so what you can do is of course build different tool chains for the different cases you have, but that was not to the taste of some uh, tool chain providers, so they came up with a mechanism called the multi-lib tool chains. <coughs> so the idea of multi-lib tool chains is that you have a single compiler, but you have multiple sysroots. And the different sysroots have been built uh, with different CPU optimization flags that target different platforms. So let's take a very spe specific example. Uh, Mental Graphics is uh, providing some, a number of tool chains, infinitely less than they did in the past. Um, but one of them is for ARM, and it's a multi-lib capable tool chain that provides three sysroots. So if you do uh, gcc dash print dash multi-lib, it gives you a list of three, three entries. So there's uh, the dot entry, kind of uh, the default one. And ARM v40 and SUM2. And then next to that, you see the, uh, some GCC flags, so uh, mArch, ARM v40, mthumb, mArch, ARM v7a. So this toolchain provides three sysroots one for ARM v5, which is the, the default one, uh, one for ARM v4, and one for ARM v7 SUM2. And the compiler is going to automatically use uh, one or the other sysroot depending on the GCC compiler flags that you have passed. So if you just say GCC ARM v5 TE print sysroot, it's going to show you the main sysroot, which is in this weird location. If you pass ARM v4 TE print sysroot, it gives you a different sysroot location in which there is a different variant of the C library that has been built for ARM v4. And then if you pass other GCC arguments like ARM v7A and uh, it's going to give you a different sysroot. And if we look at the different uh, libraries in the sysroot, we have uh, here I just dumped with ReDLF the architecture um, for which the dynamic linker has been built. So LDSO is the dynamic linker. We can see that each of them has been built for a different CPU architecture. What's the, it's the same, it's ARM, but it's different variants of the CPU architecture. So that's what uh, multi-lib tool chains are. Uh, just multiple sysroots uh, built inside the same tool chain to provide a little bit more flexibility. Um, to continue this talk, what um, I wanted to do is kind of look at what's inside a tool chain. So I took a, a build root build tool chain, did a find slash, no, not find slash, find dot, and look at all the files that we have in there and try to come up with some reasonable explanation on, on what all, all of those files are. It was not that easy for all of them, um, but I'm, I'll try the, uh, this, this exercise. So at the top level of a cross compilation tool chain generated by build root, you have something like that. So you have one directory named after the tool chain tuple. And then you have the usual like bin include lib and other directories. So if we look at the first uh, directory that's named after the, uh, the tuple, um, we have a first subdirectory called bin in which we have um, the a small set of um, <coughs> binutils programs that have been installed in there without their uh, cross compilation prefix. or so they are just named AS, LD, uh, NM, and ReDLF, and so on. So it's not a full set, but just a subset of them. And those are actually hard links 
to um, the actual um, bin utils programs which are in the, in the bin folder that we will see later. In the bin folder, they have uh, a prefix, like in that case, R, build root Linux, use libc, new ABI, HF, AS for the assembler, but they don't have such prefixes in this bin directory. And this is where GCC finds them. So as I said earlier, GCC is a compiler driver, so it's orchestrating the build. And when it needs to call LD, when it needs to call AS, it's not calling like your ARM, build blah, 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 AS, or blah, 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 LD. It's actually calling those uh, bin utils without the, um, uh, the prefix. Another thing that you find in there is the uh, set of uh, headers for the C++ standard library that were installed inside the, um, installed by GCC. For some reason, they are not part of the sysroot itself. I'm not, not sure why it puts them elsewhere, but this folder is anyway part of the uh, default um, header search paths for GCC, so it, it find, finds them naturally. Um, then in lib, we have, um, that's the location where GCC installs its, its runtime libraries, so they are built from the target. So we have libatomic, which provides a number of uh, kind of software implementation for atomic uh, um, operations when they cannot be implemented directly by using uh, CPU instructions. libgcc, which is the main GCC runtime, it has a bunch of optimized functions, um, like it does also have like 64-bit division for 32-bit architecture, floating point emulation, and a bunch of other things that um, GCC doesn't provide on its own but are needed on the targets uh, to be able to run your programs. Uh, transaction memory library, it has the standard C++ library and a subset of uh, libstd C++ with only the language support, but if you really do C++ application, it's libstd C++ that will be used. And then we have the sysroot itself, which is really what I was referring to earlier. And this is where uh, the C library uh, gets installed and the kernel headers and the C library headers and so on. Then we have the bin folder, that's the one most people look into first because that's where you find your um, cross-compilation programs, uh, binutils and GCC. And there are also wrappers for LTO, but as I said earlier, I'm not going to cover LTO in this talk. In the include folders, that's where we find the headers of the host libraries, but they are in fact not needed at all to run the tool chain. It's just an artifact of, um, the, 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 we've built those libraries, so they've installed those, their headers, but now no, that GCC has been built, they are kind of not really needed anymore. In lib, we find, so last point, the host version of GMP, MPFR, and MPC, which are needed by GCC, built for the host machine. And then we also find a bunch of other things uh, installed by, um, by GCC. So the CRT begin, CRT end files, which handle uh, constrictor, destructors, and those are linked into your executable. So that's again one of the work that uh, GCC as a compiler driver does, is it calls linker with a bunch of arguments to make sure that your program will, will work and it gets linked with all these small object files that are needed to, to make it work on the target. Um, it provides a number of headers provided by the compiler. So in fact, you not only have headers provided by the kernel and by the C library, but also a few headers provided by the compiler itself. And then it does a bunch of other things ready to fix includes. That's a GCC process to fix up header files that come from, from the system. It's kind of weird stuff. And uh, in there, it also puts the static variants of the GCC runtime libraries. Another thing that GCC installs are LD scripts. So depending on your architecture, it has a huge bunch of um, linker scripts, which are used to link applications or link shell libraries. And then depending on the flags that you pass to GCC, um, a different set of linker scripts might be used. So it just tells the linker how to lay out the final binary that, that uh, will be produced, how to combine the sections together and, and things like that. If we move on to the next part in libexec, that's where we have the actual compiler. That's where we have CC1, CC1+, so the actual compilers. And then uh, there's a program called Collect2, which is uh, what GCC calls to actually do the linking. So it's another wrapper around LD. So it's doing some stuff and then calling LD. And there's a bunch of other things related to LTO. I don't want to get into the details here. And finally, documentation translation file that's a little bit less interesting. Since time is flying, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, so architecture tuning, so GCC provides a number of configure time options to tune for a specific Arch or CPU variant. So with Arch, with CPU, with ABI, with FPU. So what they do is that they define the default value for MArch, MCPU, MABI, MFPU, and, and so on. So if you specify those at configure time, then when you call GCC, it will by default produce 
binaries uh, or libraries uh, optimized for this specific uh, CPU variant. They can always be overridden at runtime using the corresponding M options. But again, as I said earlier, beware that parts of the toolchain have already been built for the target. The C library and the GCC runtime libraries, they have already been built as part of the toolchain build process. So you need to make sure that they, are, uh, they have been built with uh, CPU architecture tuning that matches your actual target. Um, yeah, one thing that's interesting is uh, look at the GCC documentation. They have a very uh, long uh, machine dependent options where you can see the, on a per architecture basis what are the accepted options and their values. So for ARM you can see for MArch what are all the possible values uh, for the different CPU uh, variants that GCC supports. Another thing that's important to know when discussing toolchains is um, the story of ABI. So ABI from the point of view of a toolchain it defines the calling convention. So calling convention is essentially how function calls are made, how you pass arguments, how the, the, if they are pressed on the stack through registers, how the return value gets uh, returned, uh, the size of basic data types, alignment of members and structures, and when there's an operating system, how system calls are made. And from a, for a given a CPU architecture, it provides registers and provides CPU instructions. There are potentially an infinite number of ABIs that you can imagine. And so it's not necessarily that one CPU architecture has one ABI. You may have multiple ABIs that have been invented or created for that CPU architecture. And if you have two object files that have been um, bid for different ABIs, you cannot link them together. Because of course, if they disagree on what the calling conventions are, like one thing that to pass the register, you do it all on the stack, and the other one thinks that the register are, are the arguments are passed in registers, obviously linking, linking them together will not yield something that works very well. So when you link object files together, they need to uh, use the same uh, ABI. So here is an example on ARM, which is probably uh, the, the one of the architectures where this is, I guess, the most confusing. Uh, there's a history of three ABIs on, on, on the ARM Linux world. OABI, which is now completely obsolete and is not really uh, necessary to talk about it anymore. It's not even supported in, the, in uh, GCC anymore, and it's been removed for, for a long time. I still wanted to mention it to, see that, to show that there is a history of ABIs. So nowadays we have uh, two ABIs in use on ARM, EABI and EABI-HF. Um, EABI uh, is an ABI that allows to mix hard float code, so code that uses uh, floating point instructions with soft float code, so code that uh, emulates uh, the floating point operations so that it can work on processors that don't have any floating point hardware. Um, and to achieve that, uh, what it does is that it's passing the um, floating point arguments into integer registers. This way it doesn't assume that there is a floating point unit in your hardware, but it can still use it if there's one. But this uh, passing of floating point uh, arguments in integer register was causing kind of a, a performance slowdown on, on platforms where you really have you know, always a floating point unit. So um, uh, People came up with a kind of a variation of this ABI called EABI HF, so the kind of the name suggests it's hard float, where those floating point arguments are passed in floating point registers. So it uh, requires the use of an ARM CPU that has a floating point unit and its corresponding registers. And, and of course, you can't link um, EABI code with EABI HF code together. So if you have a pre built binary provided by your vendor, which is EABI, then you can only use it in EABI applications with EABI libraries. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is difference between toolchain and SDK. Sometimes people are confused by that. Uh, toolchain is the strict stance of it. It's just the four components that I mentioned. The compiler, binutil, C library, and the kernel headers. And that's just it. And um, a number of tools, especially build systems, they allow you to uh, create SDKs. So SDKs are a toolchain augmented with a number of libraries that match libraries you have available on your target. So it's a compiler, a C library, binutils, plus maybe networking libraries, crypto library, graphics libraries, and so on, and their headers that are available on your target. And such SDK allow you to build a user space application that link against those libraries, and then, of course, allow you to run them on your, on your target. So an SDK is really more than um, a, a tool chain. Um, so how can you get a cross-compilation toolchain? Um, you can uh, get them pre-built from your distro. So Ubuntu, Debian, and most of the uh, Linux distros these days have uh, pre-built toolchains uh, for various ar architectures. 
There are also organizations that uh, provide toolchains. So Linaro provides ARM and ARCH64 toolchain. Mentor Graphics has a few, but as I said, less than, than they did in the past. Uh, Imagination, which owns the MIPS architecture, provides MIPS toolchains. Um, there are other uh, vendors that would, can provide them. But you can so also build it yourself. You could do it manually, as we've seen, it's not that complicated, but there are still a few gotchas here and there. Uh, but there are some interesting tools that will help you doing that. One of them is CrossToolNG, uh, which is really specialized in building a cross-compilation toolchain. So it has a mini config-like interface, <coughs> which allows you to say um, which C library you want to use, which GCC version, which can header version, which binitus version, what is the uh, CPU architecture variant you want to tune for, and other things like that. And then you can just say go, and it builds the whole thing for you and produces a nice um, toolchain that is relocatable and that you can uh, share with other people. So it's a very nice tool. It's probably the most uh, configurable and versatile uh, option in terms of um, building toolchains. It can produce toolchains that target um, uh, Windows systems and, and really other crazy situations. But also build systems, um, building embedded Linux uh, systems usually know how to do that as well. So if you take uh, Yocto or Open Embedded, uh, Build Root, OpenWRT, and many of these other tools, they know by themselves how to build a toolchain as part of the, the overall build process for, uh, for a Linux system. And pretty often they can also reuse existing toolchains. So if your vendor provides a toolchain uh, pre-built, you can usually use, use that um, as an input for, for those uh, build systems. A few references, um, CrossToolNG has a really great documentation on how a toolchain is constructed. So even if you don't intend to use CrossToolNG, I recommend looking at that documentation for information. And the GCC and Binitils documentation are actually interesting. It's quite maybe crazy to say, it, but it's, it really contains a lot of details on uh, the GCC runtime, on the different options that you can use, and, and it gives um, lots of insights on, on how the toolchain uh, tool are working. Any questions? <laughs> yes, please, listen. I was uh, delighted to find recently that a build failed because applications that use glib want version uh, symbols in the standard library in libc. Using glib or glibc? glib applications, like gtk, yep. want version symbols in libc, yes. which I've not seen anywhere else. And so our toolchain had Unversioned symbols in That seems that seems kind of weird, but then so in so as I said, glibc provides backward compatibility for this its uh, ABI, um, so that you can uh, replace glibc without recompiling your programs. Yeah. And one of the way it does that is by using version symbols. So it uses symbols with at and then the version of the, the, the C library. You can disable that when you build glibc. Yeah. You can build a glibc without, without versioning. And then in that case, it might break existing applications that rely on those version symbols. So it's probably a toolchain that has been built without uh, glibc uh, symbol versioning. Is there any reason to turn off the size or fucking with people? Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, that's no reason. That's what yeah. it felt like. <laughs> <laughs> There's no reason, I think. Except for, for a specific embedded uh, system where you know. Yeah, if you don't care about backward compatibility. Or if you are security conscious, you want to avoid all symbols from being called in a rock uh, attack for you. Yep. Ah. Uh, Please. Can you um, yeah, so can the Canadian build is what you need when you have a build <coughs> machine that is different from the host machine that is different from the target machine. Right? So I only covered the case where build and host are the same. So it's like you're building on your laptop a toolchain that you want to run on your laptop to produce code for a different CPU architecture, different operating system. The Canadian build is what you will need if you want to build on your laptop a toolchain that will, for example, run on Windows and generate binaries for ARM Linux. That's a Canadian build that you need. And then more steps are, are needed to, to do that because, of course, for your, to allow your laptop to build a system, um, some binaries that run on Windows to build the compiler itself, you already need a cross-compiler, <laughs> right? Because you need to allow your laptop to build um, binaries for, uh, for Windows. So you first need to build a cross-compiler, which you use to build the compiler. <laughs> 
that will run on that Windows machine and, and produce binaries for ARM Linux. <laughs> that makes sense? <coughs> yes, you still need to be libc on ARM, so you also need, so you need one, one cross compiler to build the compiler itself, and you need one cross compiler to build the libc for ARM. And then you can go ahead and build the process. You need three toolchain builds. Um, I'm not sure why Yocto does it so, so complicated. I'm not sure that's the reason. Why Canadian cross nowadays is not very useful? Canadian cross is not very useful nowadays. I think the reason why um, um, Yocto might be more complicated than the process that I mentioned is that may, I don't know if they're doing it, but they might be bootstrapping GCC, which is different from doing a Canadian build. Is that you, the, the problem with the process I, I highlighted here is that I'm building GCC with the GCC that is on your machine. So if you have a different GCC than the one I have, then the toolchain that we produce is different. So you can argue that the binaries that those toolchain will produce may be affected by how the compiler itself was built. So if you want to avoid that, you need to do a bootstrapping process where you first build with your compiler, build the compiler, and using that compiler, which is the same for you and me, we build the cross compiler. So maybe they're doing that, I'm not sure, I'm, but I'm not sure. I've never dwelled into the, um, the Octo toolchain logic to build toolchains. For us, it takes about 15, 20 minutes to build a toolchain, something like that. Even less on, on high speed, high fast machines. Yes? Uh, if I build uh, uh, ARM tool change, is it specific for an ARM architecture? Is the uh, ARM for 5 So as I mentioned, um, if you build an ARM tool chain, the compiler itself is not specific to a given architecture variant. So your compiler will be able to produce binaries for whichever ARM CPU variant you want. So you can say, please build for Cortex A8, build this for uh, Cortex A9, A15, um, ARM926, and so on and so forth. No problem. That's the compiler part of it. But as part of the tool chain, a number of target libraries have been built. The GCC runtime, the C library, the dynamic linker, and all those sort of things. And so you have to verify that those have been built as part of the toolchain build process um, with the CPU variant that matches your target platform or at least is compatible with your target platform. Does that make sense? So yes, the compiler can target any CPU variant, but the, the, the libraries that are built into the, the, the toolchain as well are, have been built for a specific variant that you need to make sure matches your, your platform. Yeah, so uh, if I see a um, toolchain which is prefixed with ARM for 5, I know it's specific for ARM, but if I just see ARM, yes. I cannot be sure which uh, the libraries are used So you can be, not be, not just by looking I at it, but you can do, what was that, multi-lib stuff? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you can, if you do gcc-v, it's going to show you the whiz, uh, how it was configured, so you can see the dash dash whiz arch, dash dash whiz CPU, and so on, which it was used to uh, build GCC, and most likely those were the um, tuning that was used to build the C library. But if you want to be really sure, you can use readlf dash A, and it's going to tell you what is the, uh, the, s the architecture variant for which the, the C library was produced. So it gives you a very uh, the, uh, uh, sure information that, okay, this, it has been built for MV5 or MV4 or MV7 with uh, such or such optimization level. Right? Well, thanks a lot for attending. I'll be around uh, if you have more questions.